Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, I'm Jason Key at SB Grid in Boston. So uh, this is our um, weekly webinar series. If you've got any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat for the talk. Uh, we'll pass them on to Marcos Jodian. And uh, with that, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Marcos Sotomayor, who's at uh, Ohio State. He's going to tell us about the molecular machinery of theory. Uh, so if you could share your screen. All right. So, all right. Go right ahead. All right. Ahead. Sounds good. So let me first by let me first start by uh, thanking the SBG team uh, for the support throughout the years. Um, we're proud members of, of, uh, of the grid and we use their resources all the time. And also thank you for um, inviting me for, to do this seminar and for hosting this, uh, uh, this webinar series that is uh, quite good for us. Um, so before going into the molecular machinery of hearing, I want to briefly highlight um, and note that uh, our lab here at Ohio State works on several different systems. Um, we do large scale molecular dynamic simulations of classical carrying complexes. We have done structural studies on delta protocarines. We have also worked with some atypical carrions like carrion 17 that is shown there, and also um, uh, protocarion 24 and CHR5 in collaboration with Matt Tiska and Vanderbilt. We have also started to work with Preston and with Trip Y1 in a nice collaboration with Vera Moisen Covell. Um, we also collaborate with uh, Shrek Kalasani at the Salk Institute on designing proteins uh, for genetics. And in all these projects, we what we do is that we're uh, trying to understand what are the structural determinants of function in mechanotransduction and adhesion. Of course, as in every lab, there's always a project that doesn't really match uh, the theme, but we also work on enzymes that uh, are involved in plastic degradation, like the PETES. We somehow ended up uh, crystallizing that one. And I could talk about each of these projects for hours and hours, but lucky you, uh, I only have 50 minutes, so I have to focus. And um, I will focus only on uh, the molecular machinery of hearing. And we are going to talk today about uh, tippling cadherins, protein 15 and TMHS in TMC1. And I hope that by, by the end of the talk, of the seminar, uh, you can actually recognize these molecules and have a better understanding of how they work in hearing. Now let's go back and remember how hearing happens. So here, the key question is how do we transform sound into an electrical signal? And we're gonna go for a little bit uh, onto the basics and then go into the details. So as you know, sound comes through the outer ear into the middle ear where it moves or it makes uh, um, the middle ear bones vibrate. Those vibrations actually go into a membrane and are communicated into the cochlea in the inner ear, which is where we actually transform these uh, mechanical stimuli from sound waves into electrical signals. Uh, you have to remember that the brain understands action potentials. That's the language of the brain. So we somehow have to do this transformation to be able to understand uh, uh, sounds and, and so on. So in the cochlea, we already have um, some processing of the sound in the sense that high frequency sound will produce vibrations at the base of the cochlea, while low frequency sound will produce vibrations at the apex of the cochlea. And if we were to unroll the cochlea, so this really doesn't happen, but if we were to do it, we can uh, compare it to a piano, but in reverse mode or inverse in the sense that the high tones now are on the left, right? And the low tones are on, on the right. It's also an inverse piano in the sense that we're not producing a melody, but rather we're decomposing the individual frequencies that come with a complex sound. So this um, uh, process of um, uh, locating vibrations from sound of different frequencies in different parts of the cochlea um, is uh, a feature that we, of the cochlea that we call tonotopy. And all the mechanics and tonotopy of the cochlea was actually 
um, studied and investigated by several groups, but uh, most prominently by George von Bekesey back in the 50s. And he got the Nobel Prize for figuring out um, this um, uh, uh, process in which we can separate frequencies into different parts of the cochlea. But even back then, he noticed that we were missing something in uh, our understanding of a inner ear mechanotransduction. And that is summarized in this quote that uh, David Corey brought to my attention some time ago, in which he says, but since we have seen how step by step, the anatomical structures in the, in, in the, co in the ear localize the vibration forces in a smaller and a smaller compartment, so from the outer ear to the cochlea, it does not seem impossible that the final mechanical transformer is of molecular dimensions. So this was back in the 60s. And since then, uh, many, many researchers have been looking for this mechanical transformer of uh, molecular dimensions. Now, before we go into the molecules that form this transaction complex that we call, we need to understand the cells that are involved in mechanotransduction. And these cells are the sensory cells that are located all along the cochlea and that will sense the vibrations that are uh, spread uh, and, and, uh, across the length of the cochlea. So these cells are, the sensory cells are located in the organ of Corti uh, that is seen here in the middle of this cross section of the cochlea where they are sandwiched between two different membranes. And if we zoom in, we can see that they actually have some um, hair, uh, stru hair like structures on the top. So these sensory cells are the ones that are actually transforming uh, vibrations into electrical signals. And if we zoom in even further, we can see that the bundles are uh, um, uh, organized in, very specific, in a very specific fashion. Actually, here is um, uh, another uh, type of hair cell from the bullfrog uh, saculus. And we can see also that it features a hair bundle on the top, right? Here is the hair cell body. And this is the sensory cell that allows us to sense this uh, mechanical stimuli. Um, so these cells, as I said before, are localized all along the cochlea and are sandwiched between um, these uh, membranes in the organ of Corti and sense the vibrations that are produced by sound in such a way that when sound goes in and out of the cochlea, it lifts the membrane that supports the hair cells and then produces shearing of the hair bundles that are pushed against this yellow membrane that is called the tutorial membrane. So we are transforming now vibrations from sound into shearing of the bundle. If we were to look from the top, if we were to remove the yellow membrane and look from the top, this is what we would see in which we can have, uh, we can see the rows of uh, hair cells with the hair bundle on top and the hair cell body underneath. We have three rows of outer hair cells. We have one row of inner hair cells um, that are in charge of both amplification and sensory perception. If we zoom in even further here, we can see, as I said before, that uh, the hair bundles are not just a random set of hairs. These are very beautiful, and uh, nicely organized um, uh, bundles of hair-like structures that we call stereocilia. Um, the stereocilia are arranged in rows of uh, increasing height, like a staircase formation, and they are essential for sensory perception. Now, the hairs and bundles come in different shapes and sizes. So here we have one with a V shape, but here we have uh, one that looks more like a pyramid, right? But all of them, have this staircase formation, and all of them have fine filaments that link the tip of one stereocilium to the side of the tallest neighbor. And if you squeeze your eyes, you can probably see a filament here, another one here, another one here, and so on. If we zoom in even more in these beautiful images obtained by Bashar Kashar and co workers, we can see that the tip link is a filament, a very fine filament and that is linking the tip of the stereocilia right to the side of the neighbors. And that is around 150 to 180 nanometers. 
Now it turns out that the tip link is essential for hearing and also for your senses of balance, uh, for sensory perception by the inner ear. Why is that? The reason why is because tip links directly pull and activate mechanosensitive channels in, um, in the hair bundles. So the tip links are here are being stretched when the hair bundle is being pushed towards the tallest stereocilium. When it's pushed in this direction, then when it's pushed in the, in the other direction, the, hair, the tip links actually compress, right? And this compressing and ex, uh, this compression and extension is what stimulates mechanosensitive channels that are located at the base of the tip links. So when you push the bundle towards the tallest stereocilium, there is a force that actually gets communicated to this membrane protein, this ion channel, and the tip of the stereocilia, the base of the tip link, right? And that force actually mechanically opens the channel to allow for potassium and calcium ions, anything positive, to go from outside the cell uh, towards the inside of the cell that is highly negative. So, we know from uh, about, um, uh, about this system and how it works, right? As summarized here, that uh, when we have the a sound, the um, uh, stereocilia uh, move, shear, right? And we have the activation of the channel. We know about this since the 70s. In fact, David Corey and Jim Hatspet uh, did the first um, electrical recordings in which they push a bundle and they obtain an electrical current uh, back in the 70s. The images, uh, the first images of the tip links uh, were published by uh, Pickles and uh, co-workers co back in, in the 80s, right? But it has been very, very difficult to identify the genes that encode for the proteins that actually form uh, the tip link and um, the ion channel. So, after work from many labs uh, and, and uh, uh, that has happened over many, many years, we now know that the tip link is formed by two member, two proteins that are members of the cadence superfamily of proteins. So the lower part of the tip link, which will be this section here, is formed by protein 15, which is a protein that has a long extracellular domain with 11 extracellular repeats, quote unquote, because they are not really identical to each other, just similar to each other. These EC repeats are labeled EC1 uh, to EC11 from N to C terminus. There is a domain here next to the membrane for which we didn't know uh, much until recently. There is a transmembrane domain and a cytoplasmic domain, all in one polypeptide chain. Each of the AC repeats is around 100 amino acids. So you can guess that this is around 1100 amino acids just for the extracellular domain of protein 15. Canine 23 is an even longer uh, protein with 27 of these extracellular canine re repeats. So about 2700 amino acids and forms the upper part of the tip link. So this region here. Uh, Cadian 23 also has a single pass transmembrane domain and a cytoplasmic domain that are inserted here in the side of the tallest um, of the taller uh, stereocilium. We think that actually we have two Cadian 23s and two protogram 15s that form an heterotetramer, right? Uh, that is um, the actual uh, tip line. These two proteins are involved in inherited deafness. That's how they were uh, discovered. And when you don't have them, um, not only uh, you have profound deafness, but also um, there is progressive blindness. We know little about what these proteins are doing in the eye. And today I will focus uh, only on the role in, uh, in the ear. So to try to understand how these uh, cadence uh, work in the inner ear, we focus first on the tips of each of these uh, cadence, protein 15 and cadence 23. We were able to express and purify the EC1 and EC2 uh, repeats of uh, both proteins. Um, we show that form, they form a complex in solution. We were able to crystallize them in different forms and we obtained the first crystal structure of the 
complex between the tip of protonin 15 shown here in purple and the tip of carin 23. So here we have EC1 and EC2 for, uh, interacting in an anti-parallel fashion with EC1 and EC2 of uh, carin 23. There are nine more EC repeats going down to meet the channel. And here there are 25 more that go up to form the upper part of the tip link. But this is the connection uh, between the two. And we were able to see here also calcium ions that are important for the function of, of the tip link and the stability of the complex. This is shown here in a, uh, in a more uh, schematic way, right? So we learned that it was uh, not just EC1, EC1 interacting, but there was some overlap between the repeats, right? And we call this the handshake mode of interaction for the cations that form um, the tip link. Now, of course, when you solve a crystal structure, you wonder if what you're seeing in the structure happens in solution and whether it happens in vivo, whether this interaction would be relevant uh, uh, for a function or just a crystallographic artifact. So we did a lot of tests uh, using different techniques like isothermal titration calorimetry, surface plasma resonance and others to test and show that this uh, interaction actually happens in solution. I'm not gonna go into the details, those have been published a long time ago, but we also collaborated with uh, Kumara Lagraman to show that the interaction uh, mediated by the handshake is essential for hearing in vivo. So here you can see hair cells from a control uh, mouse and hair cells from a mouse in which the handshake interaction has been impaired you can see how the bundles are completely displayed and it looks like a tornado went through the field there, right? Um, and these mice, not surprisingly, are completely deaf and lack the sense of balance. So with this, we knew that the handshake was important, but of course, this was one handshake, right? And it was just the tip of a very long chain of easy repeats for which we knew very little. So we decided to uh, have a look and ask ourselves, are all the repeats equal? Uh, do they have similar or different structures? And the answer is that they can be very different. So it's worth actually exploring all of them to understand how they function in mechanotransaction. So in an effort by uh, multiple um, undergraduate and graduate students and postdocs uh, in the lab, we have been uh, trying to obtain structures for all the repeats of KN23. We have actually succeeded with around 22 out of the 27 EC repeats. And we are currently studying um, some of this and trying to understand how mutations that cause deafness actually affect their structure and their biochemical pro properties. Um, in here, for instance, I'm showing some of these structures. Uh, in orange, you can see places that are different among the repeats, and each number basically represents a patient that is deaf um, because of the mutation that is noted there. So we're trying to explore those mutations as well. Protein 15 is a little smaller. It has only 11 EC repeats, and, and therefore we have been able to crystallize and obtain structures for all the repeats. EC12, EC23, 345, 457, and so on. So then we can use this to assemble um, the whole thing together. By studying the individual repeats or individual components, we already learned uh, several things. We discover that actually repeats EC2 and EC3 form a parallel X dimer that is shown here in the movie that uh, we can see in the structure and that we can see also in solution in size exclusion chromatography experiments coupled to multi-angle light scattering and also in analytical ultracentrifugation experiments. So this X-dimer um, that is formed by EC23 was coupled to our structure of the handshake uh, with Canon 23 to form a model of the heterotetramer along with some other structures that we have obtained for EC345. So with this, we were able to visualize how we think um, the tetramer looks like. And a similar model was uh, put forward by uh, Larry Shapiro and Uli Mueller 
with the structure that they obtained for Proton 15 alone, EC123. Now we went beyond that and actually we saw the structure of the heterotetramer. So the Panchu and others in the lab, including Pedro de la Torre and, and um, uh, other members, saw the structure of EC1, EC2, EC3 of Proton 15 forming the X dimer and at the same time um, interacting with KM23, EC1, EC2. This structure actually allowed us to see some parts, some contacts that we had not seen in our previous model. Uh, specifically, uh, some interactions between um, KDN23 that we think may stabilize this uh, contact here in which we have the KDN23 kind of squeeze between the scissor that, form, that is formed by the X-dimer of the KDN15. Now, of course, structures are a static snapshot of uh, what we are looking at, and um, <clears throat> uh, they might miss some important features uh, or some important information that is required to understand function of proteins. So we couple our um, structural studies to molecular dynamic simulations um, using supercomputers and all atom models that allowed us to uh, put these uh, models of, um, of the tip link into a physiological-like environment in silico and apply forces like the ones that these uh, proteins would experience in, uh, in vivo. So here is a simulation of a system that has 743,000 atoms simulated for around 500 nanoseconds in which we can see the force and binding of the model of the heterotetramer, right? And uh, can be used to start to predict what are the forces required for unbinding and rupture uh, of the tippling bond. I should mention that um, uh, hearing happens at very fast time scales. So the human ear can hear uh, sounds with frequencies of up to 20 kilohertz, which gives you a time scale of 50 microseconds. Uh, that means that our simulations that are usually orders of magnitude faster than um, physiologically relevant events are actually closer to um, the physiological uh, time scale than in many other cases. So 500 nanoseconds is not that far from the microsecond time scale that we think is relevant uh, for high frequency sound uh, perception. Now, the simulations provide a dynamic view of these proteins, but sometimes the structures actually come uh, with, uh, with surprises and uh, can um, give insights into flexibility of some domains when these domains are crystallized in different conformations. So for instance, when we were looking at structures of protein 15 EC345, we noticed that the EC34 linker was found in three different conformations depending on the occupancy of calcium ions at the linker region. Something similar was observed for EC, the EC5, EC6 linker. So then with these um, different conformations observed in the crystals, we could actually build models that had different geometries that could explain different modes of interactions uh, for protein 15. For instance, if the scissor here is kind of close, then that may facilitate the formation of parallel dimers with molecules coming from the same membrane in what we call a cis configuration. While if the scissor is more open and the angle is wider here between the ends of the repeats, this coming from crystallographic conformations, then we can have a geometry that would facilitate a trans interaction like this one, in which we have two molecules coming from adjacent uh, membranes. This mode of interaction actually may explain the observation by uh, Karen Steele and Gregory Frolenkov and others that tip links might be able uh, to form without Karen 23, that immature tip links can be formed just by protein 15 itself. In addition, while we were going down the chain of uh, EC repeats obtaining structures, we observed that some of them actually have very bent uh, linkers here without any calcium ions. And we confirmed this 
in uh, by obtaining structures from multiple species and also by doing a small angle X-ray scattering that provides an envelope structure for the protein solution, indicating that this bending actually is happening in solution and also suggesting that it might be relevant for function as it provides a bending point that might actually be flexible. <clears throat> we also uh, finish uh, uh, crystallizing the different parts of uh, protein 15 by looking at repeats EC10, EC11, and a domain here at the end between EC11 and the transmembrane domain of protein 15, for which we didn't have a structure or a prediction of the fault. So we actually had a bet in the lab. I was betting that uh, that would be EC12, just another calorie repeat. But other people in the lab actually said, no, this might be different. And they actually went ahead and crystallized, uh, crystallized it. And to my surprise, it turned out to be not an EC repeat, but a different type of fault not present in cadence um, that uh, is called the ferrodoxin like domain. We term this domain the membrane adjacent domain 12 or MAT12. And we started to study its properties. Uh, we also predict that this domain actually might be present in other cadence, including uh, cadence 23 and some other long cadence. Importantly, this uh, domain favors parallel dimerization at the base of protein 15. So one MAT12 would interact with the back of a, an EC11 repeat in the crystal structure. And these interactions uh, actually are important in solution where uh, using analytical um, ultracentrifugation experiments, we were able to show that this uh, construct forms a dimer. So with all these uh, pieces and structures, we decided that we needed to go um, and uh, build a whole model, a model of the entire extracellular domain of protein 15. Uh, this was not trivial and actually we spent uh, quite a lot of time uh, making sure that we would have the right linkers between um, the different repeats. And we managed to build atomistic models of the human and mouse extracellular domains of protein 15 couple to current 23 here, EC1, EC2, and current 23, EC1, EC2, 3, uh, in the case of the uh, mouse protein. So with these models in hand, we were actually able to explore the elasticity of the monomeric protein 15, which turned out to be fairly flexible. And we did these studies using molecular dynamic simulations, again, in which we extend uh, the protein and look at how it responds to forces like the ones that uh, would uh, occur in vivo. With uh, those models, we were able to actually build a model of the whole um, uh, heterotetramer of two protein 15s that have a parallel dimerization point here in the EC23 region and another parallel uh, dimerization point here at uh, the MAT12 domain. I'm going to play this movie again because with this uh, model, we were able to start studying the elasticity of this um, uh, complex, right, in simulations with systems that involve uh, up to 1.3 million atoms and that were run for half a microsecond. Uh, from this uh, particular simulation, for instance, we learned that we could have an rolling of the MAT12 domain and um, uh, and folding before any unbinding. So then uh, we decided to try to answer a key question um, that, uh, that many people have in the field, and that is whether the tip link is a soft gating spring or rather a stiff cable that is conveying force um, uh, to the channel. And unfortunately, I already gave you the answer, but here it is again, the answer is, it's complicated. So it's not that easy um, to decide whether this is a soft spring or not. The reason why is that it depends on what conditions uh, you have for the tipping. So when we pull the monomer, we observe two phases in the force versus end-to-end -end distance response at different uh, stretching speeds. I'm gonna talk at the slow, uh, about the slowest uh, stretching speed. And you can see here a phase, phase 
in which the protein, the monomeric protein 15 extends and is soft with an elasticity of around three millinewtons per nanometer, which matches actually what has been obtained in some single molecule uh, force spectroscopy experiments by Jim Hatsped and, and co-workers. But we also have a more stiff uh, response here as the protein gets stretched. And then when we pull on the dimer, the dimer is significantly stiffer, right? Uh, but the interpretation of all this data gets complicated when we take into account not only the dynamic state of the protein, but the stretching speed uh, at which uh, we run the simulations. So in a sense, uh, the elastic response of, um, of protein 15 and likely of the whole tip link uh, probably needs to be summarized in what would be some sort of phase diagram, like the one that I'm showing you here. So depending on the amount of calcium, something that I didn't talk about, but it is also relevant for the elastic response of these proteins, the depending on the amount of tension, right? Depending on the speed at which you pull and so on, you will have different responses because either the protein might be monomeric or dimeric, depending on the amount of calcium. Um, it might be um, um, stretchable, right? Um, when you have um, enough calcium, or it may unfold actually when you don't have enough calcium uh, to bind to the linked regions, which makes the protein uh, weak. In fact, we think that uh, the MAT12 domain is mechanically weak and may be involved in unfolding at physiological uh, forces. So there are many questions open, uh, uh, open questions related to, to the behavior of uh, protein 15, but with these structures and models, we can start to tackle those and also explore what happens with the full length protein when we look at it, for instance, using um, carrier electron microscopy in collaboration with Yoshi Narui, who is in charge of uh, superb facilities uh, here at Ohio State. Uh, where we are starting to uh, obtain some initial reconstructions of the full length um, ectodomain of protein 15. And also uh, in collaboration with Felix Rico in France, we're starting to look at the dynamics of the uh, protein 15 ectodomains um, using high speed atomic force microscopy imaging, which allows us to see some interesting transitions in which parts of the protein um, they start to um, uh, assemble or disassemble as seen in these two frames here and also in these three frames here where one of the ends seems to be opening. So as I said, there are many challenges and open questions uh, for the protein 15 part. We um, uh, need to compare our results from in silico simulations, right? to results that come from in vitro experiments that are often done in different uh, time scales and under different conditions. We also need to uh, compare those in silico and in vitro results to um, what is measured in situ and in vivo, which is very often very indirect. So we don't know how the tip link responds to forces in situ or in vivo directly. Usually we know about it in indirect ways, and that is a problem right now to be able to compare um, the results that we obtain from in silico and in vitro uh, simulations and experiments to what happens um, in uh, hair cells. We know very little about the assembly of tip links and uh, very little about the parallel dimerization points of current 23. So we keep working on that. And of course, there is the question of when will we observe unbinding, unbending, or unfolding of the different parts of protein 15 and current 23? So <clears throat> we know from simulations that depending on speed, depending on how you apply the forces, and depending on calcium, uh, these three types of events, of mechanical events, uh, may happen uh, during a, a response to force. We also need to understand what happens at fast versus low stretching um, uh, speeds, right? So in a way, trying to mimic high frequency loud sound or low frequency uh, sound, right? 
And we also need to look at what happens with tiplings from different species. For instance, what happens with the tiplings that are formed in fish compared to those that are formed in turtles and, and so on. And for that, uh, Colin Nisler, a student in my group, uh, and um, uh, uh, Felix Rico and uh, Vincent Lynch are doing evolutionary analysis to try to understand what, uh, how forces have shaped the interaction between 2015 and 2023. Last but not least is the key question in the field, which is how is force communicated to the transaction channel? And this question <coughs> is very important, but um, requires answering another question first, which is what is the transaction channel? That has been a very difficult question to answer. And I'm going to go back here to my diagram uh, in which we have our tippling. We talk a lot about protein 15, right? And I would say that the tippling is the most important part of, of the system, but other people will claim that actually the channel is really the most important part, which is um, the part that opens and, and lets um, ions go through. So then the question is, how do we communicate force to that channel? And um, what is the channel? So I'm going to skip years and years of uh, research and hard work then done by many different laborat laboratories, not ours. Um, that uh, have tested many different candidates uh, for the transaction channel invertebrate hair cells. And just uh, tell you that um, nowadays we think that we have at least four transmembrane proteins that form the transaction complex. We have TMIE that likely has one or maybe two transmembrane domains. There is debate in the field about that. We have TMHS that is also known as LHF-LP5 um, that has four transmembrane domains. We have the single pass transmembrane domain of protein 15 that somehow needs to communicate force to the rest of the complex. And we have TMC proteins, TMC1 and TMC2 that are required for uh, mechanical transaction. Now, how do these proteins work together to form a channel complex? Well, we know very little about TMIE, so I cannot tell you much, except that it's likely a single transmembrane, a uh, single pass transmembrane uh, uh, protein um, that seems to be involved in uh, PIP2 uh, regulation and may actually alter uh, the properties of the membrane. And that seems to be coupled uh, to the channel complex, uh, although I'm not so sure that it's a direct coupling. Then we have TMHS and 2015, and for this, we do have more uh, structural data that is coming from Eric Guo's lab that saw the structure of TMHS here in purple, coupled to the 2015 transmembrane domains shown here in magenta. So in this uh, model that uses um, Eric Guo's uh, structure along with our structures of the uh, lower part of the tippling, so we could have an atomistic model of this entire thing, we can see the two TMHS tightly coupled to the transmembrane domains of protein 15. And here our MAT12 domain with the EC11, then the EC10 and EC9 with the kink that I had mentioned before. We have used this model actually to place it in a membrane in a system of over 600,000 atoms in which we apply forces to stretch it and see what would happen with the complex as we apply forces uh, uh, that are physiologically relevant. And the main message here is that we see a lot of membrane bending and curvature in simulations, in this case, for instance, that lasted around uh, 800 nanoseconds. So before actually any um, unfolding of some of the MAD domain, you will see in the simulation how the MHS gets decoupled a little bit from protein 15, 
but even before that, we have some um, uh, curving and bending um, of, of the membrane. So that tells us about this part of the system, but what about TMC1 and TMC2? And here the story is a little bit more complicated because we do not have um, a structure, either um, a crystal structure or clarion model, right? That we, um, uh, that we could use for understanding its function. Uh, at least not yet. I'm pretty sure that there are many groups uh, trying to obtain uh, the structure, but so far um, I haven't seen any model out yet. So how do we start uh, working with this problem? Well, back in 2009, Han et al. actually published a paper in which they did some bioinformatic analysis and discover that TMCs are loosely related in sequence uh, terms to the anoctamine or TMM16 family of proteins. So this uh, was a known fact in 2009, but then in uh, 2014, the structure of uh, TMM16, uh, the fungal scramblease TMM16, was published and was a really exciting uh, event for people in the hearing field that knew that um, TMCs uh, could be related to uh, TMM16s because this structure provided a template that we could use to actually uh, start investigating uh, TMC1 function. It's interesting to uh, look at this structure in a little bit of detail because it has several features that are uh, unusual. So this TMM16 family um, um, it has members that are uh, lipid scramblases, but also an ion channels. And in this particular case, what was crystallized was the fungal scramblase, and it was crystallized in a dimeric state. So this is a calcium activated lipid scambolase and uh, that forms an homodimer with 10 transmembrane helices in each subunit. So you can see the left unit here, the right hand side uh, unit, right? And the two calcium uh, binding sites here um, on the sides uh, on one dimer and one monomer and the other monomer, right? But the most important feature of this scambolase is that uh, the activity of the enzyme of uh, scrambling, uh, moving lipids from one leaflet to the other happens at a lipid facing groove that is located here. So this lipid facing groove is the active part of the scramblers and we have two uh, for the dimer. So one on the left hand side, on the right hand side and one on the left hand side. So then that means that this template would be very unusual uh, for an ion channel. Why? Because usually we have ion channels, typical ion channels that are tetramers, and that in this tetrameric um, uh, complex form the pore in the middle where we have all the units coming together. In the case of the scrambler system M16, what we had was a dimer that did not have a pore in the middle, but rather had these grooves on the sides where lipids would, would uh, actually flip, uh, showing their uh, head groups, um, moving the head groups into the um, hydrophilic groove, right? Going from one side to the other. So, we were excited about this um, uh, possible template for TMCs, but it was odd because it was not a template uh, for a typical uh, ion channel. So it was exciting, but also it was a lipid scramble. It was not an ion channel. And this was published in 2014. And beside, despite our doubts, we did start uh, doing some models and simulations at that time. And then in uh, 2017, actually there was a second structure uh, for a member of, uh, of the family, in this case, an anion channel, TMM16A, that also showed a dimer 
and also show a conduction pathway that would be located on the side of the dimer, not in the middle, right, and facing the lipids. So we would have a groove that would be facing um, the lipids. There were several structures published um, that year describing this protein and some of its uh, uh, properties. So it seems that, okay, we have a lipid scramblease and we have an anion uh, channel. So this might serve as a good uh, model for uh, TMCs, but the uh, ion channel in hair cells is supposed to be cation selective. So we have a template here but it's a template from an anionic channel. Would our model of TMC, based on these templates, either the scramblase or the anion channel, conduct or uh, be able to uh, permeate uh, potassium ions or sodium ions? We went ahead and built the model and actually look at the potential permeation pathway and run several simulations in which, in which we show that the transmembrane uh, uh, domain that is facing um, the lipids here in the middle, uh, where the groove um, uh, is, would actually be able to uh, permeate uh, potassium and would be hydrated. <clears throat> By that time, uh, several groups have already looked at, um, at the models of, um, of TMCs based on TMM16. David Corey in parallel had uh, done his own um, uh, modeling and along with um, uh, Nuronisa Akius, uh, they had actually shown that um, TMCs were forming uh, dimers. So that was consistent uh, with the model. And then uh, Jeff Holt along with uh, Bifen Pang and others had been done a lot of hard work on uh, testing the permeation pathway of TMCs experimentally by looking at the accessibility of um, several residues uh, throughout the putative pore. So by 2018, uh, we joined forces and actually put a whole story together in which we uh, propose that the pore of the channel is formed by um, the S4, S6, S5, and S7 helices of uh, TMC uh, in a model that is consistent with data from uh, these laboratories and also from models done by Angela Ballesteros that uh, was uh, doing parallel work at NIH in the lab of uh, Kenton Schwartz. And uh, interestingly, at more or less about the same time, um, the structures of OSCA channels uh, came out, which are actually cation um, uh, channels. So that and that show a dimer and that have also similar topology and that are um, uh, um, responsive to membrane stretch. Also in agreement with what we think uh, would be uh, a model of activation uh, for TMCs. Now, of course, there are many questions um, that are left um, and answered. Um, and uh, I put here in the title, a 60 year quest from uh, uh, von Beckes' words, right? A, si a 60 year uh, quest comes to an end. Not really, I think it's just the beginning. Uh, we need to answer uh, several questions related uh, to um, uh, how these uh, channels work. And some of the, these questions are here. So for instance, we need to understand exactly how TMCs are activated. And we need to understand uh, if they need accessory subunits to work as ion channels. For instance, we have TMIE that we don't know exactly what it's doing. We have TMHS that I think is basically providing a way to um, curve or uh, bend the membrane for protein 15. And we have other proteins that are known to or are speculated to interact with uh, TMC, with vertebrate TMCs like CYP2 and ANK. Um, recent work from uh, the labs of Nureki, Hattori, and Yan actually have shown that non mammalian TMCs can be pore forming some units in liposomes. 
And that um, is strong evidence that um, uh, uh, the accessory subunits are not essential for the function of these proteins as ion channels. It doesn't mean that they are not required to work well in, uh, in hair cells, right? But the TMCs by themselves might be able to form a pore that is mechanosensitive and that is responsive to membrane stretch. The other question that we have is uh, related to whether our models can really conduct uh, ions. So in um, our previous work, we show a spontaneous permeation of uh, potassium that went into the groove that was hydrated, suggesting that that was the path for ions to uh, go through. But we didn't measure, we didn't apply a voltage in the simulations to see how the ions would cross um, uh, and go along the pore, right? And whether the models that we had were representative of a closed, intermediate, or open state of the channel. So to answer that question, we actually took our model and ran dynamic simulations in which we applied a biasing voltage, in this case of 200 millivolts, that seems a little high, but it's not that high compared to the 125 millivolts that sometimes you can reach in hair cells. And we can, using these simulations with this voltage, we can start to see uh, whether ions can go through the pore and how this pore that is not only lined by proteins, but also by head groups of uh, lipids behaves in response to voltage. So here is a potential map showing that we apply the voltage in the potential path of, um, of ions account of the uh, ions that cross, mainly potassium with very little uh, chloride going through, and uh, a visualization of how these uh, potassium ions in red go through the pore, through the lipid facing groove, right? And interact not only with the protein, but also with the lipids, and in particular with the head groups that I'm showing. I'm not showing all the lipids, we're not showing all the lipids because um, uh, then you wouldn't be able to see anything there. We have done that in longer time scales of up to 500 uh, nanoseconds with a, a model that doesn't have the extracellular and intracellular loop. So just the transmembrane part is a little smaller, so then we can go faster. And in those models, we can see conductances that match actually what we see in uh, what is expected for the hair cell transduction channel. We're studying uh, what happens with mutations that cause uh, inherited deafness. And surprisingly, we see a little bit of more chloride permeation in, uh, in these models when we have these mutations uh, incorporated. So um, the conductance, as I said, is not that far uh, from, um, from what we expect uh, for the uh, transduction channel that should be between 50 and 150 picosiemens, right? Um, and the models are therefore supporting uh, the idea that we have a dimeric TMC in which the pore is partially formed by these uh, lipids, right? That form the outer part um, of, of the pore. Uh, since I'm running out of time, I just want to emphasize that this is a very different channel, as you can see illustrated here, where we have density of water in blue and density of head groups in purple. And you can see the permeation pathway on the side, not at the dimer interface, but on the side, right? And that is lined up not only by protein, but also by lipids. So with that, we can start to explore what are the gating mechanisms uh, for this channel that might be involved actually um, uh, movements of alpha helices, which we have seen in our simulations, especially of alpha four and alpha six, uh, blocking uh, by lipids, right? And um, other motions that might be involved uh, or related to how protein 15 communicates force um, to the channel. Uh, interestingly, from these um, uh, studies, I think there are two models that are um, uh, becoming uh, prominent, one in which we have all these proteins together uh, forming a complex that is stretched directly by, by protein 15, but a second model in which 
protein 15 is actually coupled to just TMHLs. And when you pull, the membrane deformation is what communicates force uh, to TMCs, which will be consistent with the fact that TMCs are similar to OSCA channels and that uh, TMCs and non mammalian TMCs in liposomes are stretch activated. However, each model has pros and cons. There are some experimental results that cannot be explained, at least not easily, um, by membrane stretching, like for instance, the swing of the gate um, of the transduction channel and so on. So there is still plenty to do uh, to really understand how all this comes together to mediate hair cell transduction, including what happens with some additional proteins that might be binding here to TMC1, like the anchoring uh, 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 proteins that are very flexible and that could form uh, a gating spring. Uh, we still don't know if this is true uh, for hair cells, but we did simulations of this long, long time ago, and the anchor repeats have the right properties there to be the gating spring. With that, I'm going to finish um, by showing uh, pictures of all the people uh, that have been doing the work in the lab. Um, I put pictures and names of them throughout the presentations. Uh, all of them um, have worked really hard to make this possible. And I wish I could uh, uh, name all of them uh, at once, but there are many uh, throughout the years. Here is, of course, our mandatory uh, Zoom picture uh, for pandemics uh, time and the list of names of uh, past and present members, as well as uh, collaborators that have been working with us, funded uh, by multiple um, agencies, right? And we support also from uh, the SBG. And with that, I think I'm uh, a little past uh, my time, but I'll finish and I will be happy to uh, take any questions and um, uh, open the floor for discussions. Thank you very much, Marcus. It was fantastic. It was really good. Um, questions. I'm sure there are some. I have some. Uh, you can send them by chat. You can also use the reactions button to raise your hand, and that will bump you to the top of my list, and I can call on you. We can unmute, and we can discuss. Uh, there's um, uh, a decent number of people on the call, so maybe we'll, just for the sake of order, we'll try to keep it with a, a raised hand, just kick it off at least. So. Um, or send them by chat and I can pass them on. I mean, one question that I have that came to mind immediately and uh, uh, is the sort of characteristics of these EC domains, right? So you've got, you know, dozens of these literally like they crystallize. Are they rocks? Are they dynamic? There's a lot of beta. So I see beta, I think of the, these are like super, you know, super yeah. rigid little <clears throat> rock structures. Uh, so or are they, yeah, are they variable? So the EC repeats, all of them have this um, Greek key motif and with seven beta strands, and they are fairly stiff in our model. So a single EC repeat by itself, you would have to apply a very large force to actually break it apart and um, um, uh, get something flexible. But once you start to have a chain, if the linkers are flexible between the EC repeats, then you can get some uh, elasticity, right? And that's what we see in some linkers that don't have calcium ions or when calcium ions is not bound between the linkers. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I don't think that the EC repeats by themselves are flexible, at least not in our models. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of a beads on a string, the dynamics come from the linkers. Exactly. Themselves. Now you surprised? also ask uh, whether they were different or not, and they are. And um, there are differences, and I think those differences are important, for instance, for parallel dimerization, right? And in some cases, might be um, uh, related to some other function or interaction with other proteins that we don't know of. Um, so and it's puzzling sometimes to find mutations that cause deafness, but that somehow don't, um, are not obviously affecting the protein. Yeah, so on a sort of related note, the, uh, the models you have have them kind of coming apart and coming back together again. I guess when I think of you know, protein domains, uh, even sort of 
even very modest affinity between those two uh, sort of monomers, the avidity effects would allow them to sort of zip up into sort of a, almost like a, uh, a coil or like a big sort of coil yeah. of beads, right? But when you draw it, you don't, you don't see that. Like you're not proposing that. Is there data that suggests that they are not actually doing that? So, so far, so we can have things like, for instance, so you have these parallel models. And so far, all the domains that we have studied are monomeric except for EC23 and the bottom of Proton 15. And for Karen 23, we still haven't found really the dimerization domain. We have some clues, but, but not, not really. Now, the other point is you have Proton 15 and Karen 23, and you may think, well, this may actually slide, right? And kind of form something that is a little shorter, right? And, uh, provide some sliding mechanism uh, for elasticity. Yeah. But so far, the evidence is that these proteins in vitro and perhaps in vivo interact tip to tip. So we haven't seen yet an interaction that involves other parts. Now, that doesn't mean that those could not happen, right? So yeah, we have non specific contacts that I'm sure will happen at some point or another, right? Uh, whether they are physiologically relevant is a little more difficult to establish, right? And especially when you have low affinity contacts, it's very difficult to test, right? Whether they are really important or not. Uh, so that is something that, that could happen, but that so far in all the experiments that uh, we and others have done, we haven't seen. So we had a question here from, uh, from Tristan Bell um, for TMC1. Are the extracellular loop regions also contributing to the chloride conductance channel? And do you see any evidence gating outside the membrane? So <clears throat> for uh, um, uh, TMC1, I think that they, even when we don't have the extracellular or the intracellular loops, we see some chloride conductance. Now it's mainly potassium. I want to stress that, except when we do the mutations, and the systems that have the mutations don't have the extracellular or intracellular loops. So we think that the pore is wide enough that uh, cations will go through, but every so often maybe a chloride. And when you have mutations, you may uh, pro uh, somehow uh, modify that selectivity. That's what the model predicts. We don't know if that is true or not, right? And uh, we don't know what happens if TMC is coupled to TMHS or uh, TMIE and, and they're not, right? Um, the other question was related to gating. And uh, so far, what we have seen is motions in some helices that um, are related to um, the conducting states that we observe. So something that I didn't say is that in the dimer, we see one monomer conducting much more than the other. And we have struggled uh, looking at uh, whether it's the protein or the lipids that are somehow blocking that second pore, right? Because they are tightly coupled. It's, it's a little difficult to establish which one is the one that is really um, uh, setting the channel that monomer close. I have more, but I'll, I'll let uh, Pete Meyer from our uh, semester grid here jump in. He's got his hand up, so. Uh, great talk. And I had, I had a question about the, the, the calcium and elasticity mm -hmm. part where you mentioned. Do you think that that interaction is something that has functional implications for calcium specific channels or is that just, you know, accidental? as far as structural ions that are available for made, being made use of? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think, um, so the cochlea, and this is something that also I failed to mention, controls the amounts of calcium very tightly. So the hair cells are bathed in endolin that has concentrations of calcium that uh, vary between 20 and 40 micromolar. So, that is very unusual. Usually extracellular calcium is on the millimolar range. Uh, and there is some debate about whether um, the tectorial membrane also stores calcium and therefore the local 
calcium concentration around the tip links is higher or not. But I don't think that is random that, that uh, calcium is used uh, in the system because it's tightly, the concentrations are tightly controlled. And also because many of the mutations that I mentioned that cause inherited deafness, what they do is that they do modify the acidic residues, aspartates and glutamates that are involved in calcium binding. And I think that that leads to some flexibility, but also some um, um, uh, um, some weakening of the linker region because the calcium ions are not there anymore to withstand the force when you're yeah. uh, applying the force. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question from Pedro de la Torre. Pedro, you can All go right, ahead. Pedro. Pedro, we okay. cannot hear you. Thank you, Thank you Marcos. Uh, hola, hola. For your presentation, it was an amazing journey in your lab, crystallizing and solving the structure of PCA15 and current mm -hmm. We haven't finished, but we will make it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, Marcos. So, yes. Or in vitro experiments are kind of different than other um, experiments, for example, from Martin Pascal lab, where mm -hmm. they show that single tip link tensions are, or they increase in low calcium. So do you have an opinion about it? Or do you think we are missing like another piece of the tip link, another protein that behaves different in presence of calcium? All right, so Pedro, Pedro is mentioning work from Martin uh, 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 Pascal, Pascal Martin, that uh, measure different um, um, elasticity of the tip link along the cochlea. And they do so by also taking out calcium from the system and measuring the motion of the bundle um, that is related to the elasticity of the bundle and of the tip link. So, what they see is that when you apply EGTA, somehow the tension goes up in the tip link, but that is very counterintuitive when you think about uh, cadherins and calcium. Now, the time scale of those experiments is very long, and I think that there are other things that are happening there. So one caveat of most of the in vivo data that tries to understand tip link behavior is that all the data is obtained in a way that you're not measuring tip link dynamics directly. So those are indirect measurements. And I think that there is something else that is happening when you apply the EGTA that leads to a bundle displacement that we interpret as um, increasing tension, but I don't think that that is coming from uh, the cadaverian tip links. I see. Thank you, Marcos. One more question. Uh, question, Tyler Morris. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. so, hi. Um, I kind of had a question regarding um, one of the points you made in your talk about um, the characterization of the um, tip link as like a stiff spring or a soft spring. Um, mm -hmm. What might be the reason we want to um, understand that question further, and how might that help our understanding of sound transduction? Yeah, that's a very good question. So. Um, in uh, electrophysiolog electrophysiological measurements, um, uh, people have identified a soft spring that can modulate how um, the channel is open. And that has direct implications on uh, sensory perception because depending on the type of stimuli, you may want to have a system that is very responsive to small motions, right? That would be a stiff uh, gating spring or a system that actually waits a little bit until you have a real stimulus, not brown and motion, for instance, right? To open the channel. So you want to be on the right threshold to get the channel so you don't get uh, to hear the noise in your ears, right? Um, so the elasticity of the tip link and of the gating spring is very important to understand the dynamic range of the channel and, right, and how um, and that is related to sensory perception. Um, in this particular case, uh, or so far, we don't know what that soft element is. Um, we know it exists from the electrophysiological measurements, but again, these are indirect measurements. And 
we assign this elasticity to some theoretical gating spring, which we usually say is the tip length, right? Um, but we don't know for sure that the tip length is what is stretching, um, uh, maybe something else. So I think it's important to understand uh, how these channels uh, work, not only from an intellectual point of view, but also how the uh, thresholds for functioning in vivo are set. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Sotomayor. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everyone for the great questions. It's a, a fantastic story. This All right, very, great. very happy uh, to be here and thank you for hosting this. Um, there is plenty more, but unfortunately in 50 minutes is always yeah. difficult to, to put all, all, all there. Uh, so um, my students can maybe come back and, uh, and show some of their work uh, at, the, at the seminar maybe later on. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. That'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone, thank you for joining. Be sure to join us next week. We've got Woody Sherman, uh, Silicon Therapeutics. So I think that's going to be a great talk too. So uh, you can catch us next week, Tuesday, same time. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.